Psychological Types by C.G. Young, as translated by H. Godwin Baines. Chapter 10. General Description of the Types. The Extroverted Type. Section 2. The Attitude of the Unconscious. It may perhaps seem odd that I should speak of attitude of the unconscious. As I have already sufficiently indicated, I regard the relation of the unconscious to the conscious as compensatory. The unconscious, according to this view, has as good a claim to an I attitude as the conscious. In the foregoing section, I emphasize the tendency to a certain one-sidedness in the extroverted attitude due to the controlling power of the objective factor in the course of psychic events. The extroverted type is constantly tempted to give himself away, apparently in favor of the object, and to assimilate his subject to the object. I have referred in detail to the ultimate consequences of this exaggeration of the extroverted attitude, vis-à-vis to the injurious suppression of the subjective factor. It is only to be expected, therefore, that a psychic compensation of the conscious extroverted attitude will lay a special weight upon the subjective factor, i.e., we shall have to prove a strong egocentric tendency in the unconscious. Practical experience actually furnishes this proof. I do not wish to enter into a causistical survey at this point, so must refer my readers to the ensuing sections, where I shall attempt to present the characteristic attitude of the unconscious from the angle of each function type. In this section, we are merely concerned with the compensation of a general extroverted attitude. I shall, therefore, confine myself to an equally general characterization of the compensating attitude of the unconscious. The attitude of the unconscious, as an effective complement to the conscious extroverted attitude, has a definitely introverting character, It focuses libido upon the subjective factor, i.e., all those needs and claims which are stifled or repressed by a too extroverted conscious attitude. It may be readily gathered from what has been said in the previous section that a purely objective orientation does violence to a multitude of subjective emotions, intentions, needs, and desires, since it robs them of the energy which is their natural right. Man is not a machine that one can reconstruct as occasion demands upon other lines and for quite other ends in the hope that it will then proceed to function in a totally different way, just as normally as before. Man bears his age-long history with him. In his very structure is written the history of mankind. The historical factor represents a vital need to which a wise economy must respond. Somehow the past must become vocal and participate in the present. Complete assimilation to the object, therefore, encounters the protest of the suppressed minority, elements belonging to the past and existing from the beginning. From this quite general consideration, it may be understood why it is that the unconscious claims of the extroverted type have an essentially primitive, infantile, and egoistical character. When Freud says that the unconscious is only able to wish, this observation contains a large measure of truth for the unconscious of the extroverted type. Adjustment and assimilation to objective data prevent inadequate subjective impulses from reaching consciousness. These tendencies, thoughts, wishes, affects, needs, feelings, etc., take on a regressive character corresponding with the degree of their repression i.e., the less they are recognized, the more infantile and archaic they become. The conscious attitude robs them of their relatively disposable energy charge, only leaving them the energy of which it cannot deprive them. This remainder, which still possesses a potency not to be underestimated, can be described only as primeval instinct. Instinct cannot be rooted out from an individual by any arbitrary measures, It requires the slow, organic transformation of many generations to effect a radical change, for instinct is the energic expression of a definite, organic foundation. Thus, with every repressed tendency, a considerable sum of energy ultimately remains. This sum corresponds with the potency of the instinct and guards its effectiveness, 
in spite of the deprivation of energy which made it unconscious. The measure of extroversion in the conscious attitude entails a like degree of infantilism and archaism in the attitude of the unconscious. The egoism which so often characterizes the extrovert's unconscious attitude goes far beyond mere childish selfishness. It even verges upon the wicked and brutal. It is here that we find in fullest bloom that incest wish described by Freud. It is self-evident that these things are entirely unconscious, remaining altogether hidden from the eyes of the uninitiated observer, so long as the extroversion of the conscious attitude does not reach an extreme stage. But wherever an exaggeration of the conscious standpoint takes place, the unconscious also comes to light in a symptomatic form, i.e., the unconscious egoism, infantilism, and archaism lose their original compensatory characters and appear in more or less open opposition to the conscious attitude. This process begins in the form of an absurd exaggeration of the conscious standpoint, which is aimed at a further repression of the unconscious, but usually ends in a reductio ad absurdum of the conscious attitude, i.e. a collapse. The catastrophe may be an objective one, since the objective aims gradually become falsified by the subjective. I remember the case of a printer who, starting as a mere employee, worked his way up through two decades of hard struggle, till at last he was the independent possessor of a very extensive business. The more the business extended, the more it increased its hold upon him, until gradually every other interest was allowed to become merged in it. At length he was completely enmeshed in its toils, and as we shall soon see, this surrender eventually proved his ruin. As a sort of compensation to his exclusive interest in the business, certain memories of his childhood came to life. As a child, he had taken great delight in painting and drawing. But instead of renewing this capacity for its own sake, as a balancing side interest, he canalized it into his business and began to conceive artistic elaborations of his products. His fantasies unfortunately materialized. He actually began to produce after his own primitive and infantile taste, with the result that after a very few years, his business went to pieces. He acted in obedience to one of our civilized ideals, which enjoins the energetic man to concentrate everything upon one end in view. But he went too far, and merely fell a victim to the power of his subjective infantile claims. But the catastrophic solution may also be subjective, i.e. in the form of a nervous collapse. Such a solution always comes about as a result of the unconscious counterinfluence, which can ultimately paralyze conscious action. In which case, the claims of the unconscious force themselves categorically upon consciousness, thus creating a calamitous cleavage which generally reveals itself in two ways. Either the subject no longer knows what he really wants and nothing any longer interests him, or he wants too much at once and has too keen an interest, but in impossible things. The suppression of infantile and primitive claims, which is often necessary on civilized grounds, easily leads to neurosis, or to the misuse of narcotics such as alcohol, morphine, cocaine, etc. In more extreme cases, the cleavage ends in suicide. It is a salient peculiarity of the unconscious tendencies that, just so far as they are deprived of their energy by a lack of conscious recognition, they assume a correspondingly destructive character, and as soon as this happens, their compensatory function ceases. They cease to have a compensatory effect as soon as they reach a depth or stratum that corresponds with a level of culture absolutely incompatible with our own. From this moment, the unconscious tendencies form a block, which is opposed to the conscious attitude in every respect. Such a block inevitably leads to open conflict. In a general way, the compensating attitude of the unconscious finds expression in the process of psychic equilibrium. A normal extroverted attitude does not, of course, mean that the individual behaves invariably in accordance with the extroverted schema. Even in the same individual, many psychological happenings may be observed in which the mechanism of introversion is concerned. A habitus can be called extroverted only when the mechanism of extroversion predominates. 
In such a case, the most highly differentiated function has a constantly extroverted application, while the inferior functions are found in the service of introversion, i.e., the more valued function, because the more conscious, is more completely subordinated to the conscious control and purpose, whilst the less conscious, in other words, the partly conscious inferior functions, are subjected to conscious free choice in a much smaller degree. The superior function is always the expression of the conscious personality, its aim, its will, and its achievement, whilst the inferior functions belong to the things that happen to one. Not that they merely beget blunders, e.g. lapsus linguae or lapsus calami, but they may also breed half or three-quarter resolves, since the inferior functions also possess a slight degree of consciousness. The extroverted feeling type is a classical example of this, for he enjoys an excellent feeling rapport with his entourage, yet occasionally opinions of an incomparable tactlessness will just happen to him. These opinions have their source in his inferior and subconscious thinking, which is only partly subject to control and is insufficiently related to the object. To a large extent, therefore, it can operate without consideration or responsibility. In the extroverted attitude, the inferior functions always reveal a highly subjective determination with pronounced egocentricity and personal bias, thus demonstrating their close connection with the unconscious. Through their agency, the unconscious is continually coming to light. On no account should we imagine that the unconscious lies permanently buried under so many overlying strata that it can only be uncovered, so to speak, by a laborious process of excavation. On the contrary, there is a constant influx of the unconscious into the conscious psychological process. At times, this reaches such a pitch that the observer can decide only with difficulty which character traits are to be ascribed to the conscious and which to the unconscious personality. This difficulty occurs mainly with persons whose habit of expression errs rather on the side of profuseness. Naturally, it depends very largely also upon the attitude of the observer whether he lays hold of the conscious or the unconscious character of a personality. Speaking generally, a judging observer will tend to seize the conscious character, while a perceptive observer will be influenced more by the unconscious character, since judgment is chiefly interested in the conscious motivation of the psychic process, while perception tends to register the mere happening. But insofar as we apply perception and judgment in equal measure, it may easily happen that a personality appears to us as both introverted and extroverted, so that we cannot at once decide to which attitude the superior function belongs. In such cases, only a thorough analysis of the function qualities can help us to a sound opinion. During the analysis, we must observe which function is placed under the control and motivation of consciousness, and which functions have an accidental and spontaneous character. The former is always more highly differentiated than the latter, which also possess many infantile and primitive qualities. Occasionally, the former function gives the impression of normality, while the latter have something abnormal or pathological about them.